Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I'm speaking to you from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Well, Six Weeks, Six Issues is our new weekly talk series where we're exploring the big issues we're facing as COVID-19 changes the world around us. We're bringing you the top policy experts and decision makers to answer your questions. And today we're looking at the future of tertiary education. Now we'll aim to get through as many of your questions as we can. Some of you have submitted questions in advance, but you can also submit questions during this event through our Slido function. And you can also vote for questions that you'd like and that helps me with moderation. I'd like to introduce to you our guest speakers. Dr. Katie Allen is the federal member for uh, for Higgins in Melbourne South East. Dr. Allen is also a paediatrician and former medical researcher. She worked at the Royal Children's Hospital for 28 years and was a professor at the University of Melbourne and the University of Manchester and director of the Australian Centre of Food and Allergy Research. Dr. Allen has published more than 300 scientific papers and has been director of the Population Health Research Theme at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And she's representing Education Minister Dan Tien, who was unable to join us. Professor John Dewar, AO, is Vice Chancellor and President of La Trobe University. He's an internationally known family law researcher and graduate of the University of Oxford. Professor Dewar held leadership positions at Griffith University and the University of Melbourne, where he was provost before joining La Trobe. He's also deputy chair of Universities Australia, a peak body for the sector representing 39 universities across the nation. And Andrew Norton is professor of the practice of higher education policy at the Centre for Social Research and Methods at the Australian University, a national university. He's based in Melbourne. Having worked in higher education policy since 1997, Professor Norton is recognised as one of the nation's leading voices in the sector. Professor Norton um, was involved in the, the 2013 and 14 federal government review of the demand-driven system for higher education funding and the 2016-17 expert panel advising on higher education reform. Well, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us. Well, John Dewar, uh, faced with the reality of reduced revenue, like so many sectors, universities are exploring a new future. What does that look like? Well, thanks, Kate, and hello, everyone. Um, I think in the short term, it looks pretty grim um, for the sector, just as I said, because of the uh, significant downturn in revenue. But like all universities, we're thinking about what uh, that means for us in the longer term. Um, so I, I think each university will chart its own course. But um, in the short term, we're looking firstly at really trying to identify what are our strengths? What are the things that we're really good at um, and where we can aim to be nationally and globally really competitive and that's a process we're going through at the moment um, but there'll be some things that will change the way we do things at the university um, probably permanently that have come out of this uh, COVID pandemic for example we've probably seen the uptake of technology um, faster than would otherwise have been the case I think we've probably accelerated um, that process by about a decade uh, in the last few months. So I think the, the use of technology in teaching and the way universities are run will significantly increase as a result of this. Um, and I th also think that uh, there's greater acceptance among students and among staff about greater flexibility in the way we work and study. And I think that's gonna remain a permanent feature of the sector. But some of the, the concerns I think really revolve around Staffing, we're gonna be losing a lot of jobs. We will be a smaller sector um, for the foreseeable future, probably for at least five or six years and maybe longer than that. Um, and the sector's capacity to sustain uh, the research effort that we've been uh, engaged in for the last 10 or 20 years, uh, the fact that Australian universities are now ranked amongst the, the top universities in the world is a reflection of that. Um, I think that is gonna be really tough. Universities have invested a lot of money uh, in the R&D uh, function and the, the national research and development effort, um, but that's gonna be, become a lot harder to sustain 
um, at least for the next four or five years. So there, there, I think there'll be some positive, some exciting things that will come out of this and some real change, um, but also some real concerns about um, the productivity and innovation um, that the, the, the nation has traditionally turned to its universities to provide, uh, at least in part. Well, Katie, Alan, um, does the federal government see this as the sector sort of burning platform, the moment when universities reimagine a very different future? Yeah, thank you, Kate. And um, having come from a medical research environment and worked with universities for a long time, it's um, interesting to be uh, in government and to see how complicated this whole issue has become. And COVID has really brought that right into the spotlight. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that the higher education sector, you know, is a very valuable contribution uh, to uh, us as a trading nation, as an export market, but of course, most importantly, as delivery of the education of the future for our domestic students. And um, there's no doubt that the sort of the marketing model that universities have relied on has been a very productive and very profitable marketing model, you could say, where you know, international students' fees are contributing to research, which then contributes, contributes to global rankings, which then attracts more international students. Um, and that has kind of been a virtuous cycle and been very successful. Um, and of course, of course, as everyone knows, as we, we're seeing this pandemic um, we really undermine that model, there's going to be a very, very significant short-term downturn in, in, the, in the area of research. And I personally am, am very interested in what we can do uh, for the sector to support the sector in this short term, but also in the medium and long term. And I personally think at the sort of very big picture area, we need to start thinking about how do we make sure that uh, investment in, in, in areas like research um, are smooth through economic downturns, smooth through changes to um, international students so that we can have a, a smooth, um, model economically going forward. So there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment with vice chancellors. I think there's the, the Minister of Education is in discussion with vice chancellors around this uh, issue. But we do know that universities um, are countercyclical, and so um, when there is a, a downturn in any economic environment, uh, domestic students will turn to universities to upskill themselves and to look for training. And so as a government, we're looking to incentivize students. Um, and this is controversial. I'm, you know, I put that on the table about the way that we are uh, making those decisions. But we're making a determination that it's important to indicate to students. And people will argue about whether that incentivisation works or not. But there's a dedicated philosophical approach to the fact that we need to ensure that students are ready for uh, job ready for the future. And that isn't that isn't something that's just COVID, in, in the COVID pandemic. It, it is, has uh, brought focus into this area, but there's absolutely no doubt um, that the world is transitioning with regards to the type of jobs that the kids of uh, today, and I've got four kids who are, you know, end of school and into university, so it's something at a very personal level I've kept a very close eye on, is how do you make sure that the kids are going to have the jobs or the skills for the future? And I think, you know, it's well recognised that the old view that, you know, someone went to uni and could get a job has now been dispelled. Um, having a university degree makes you competitive for a job, but there is a huge amount of competition out there for uh, the jobs uh, for the young. And we need to make sure that we're preparing them with the skills and education they need uh, for jobs of the future. Um, so, you know, I hear um, basically, you know, I completely understand where John's coming from with regards to the concern and the flow on effect of student numbers. It's probably worth mentioning that um, I think, and I might correct me if I'm wrong because you know, I'm not the expert, but I understand about 80% of international students are here still this year, um, all working online. So there has been a, a big drop, of course, in the, in the sort of funding model, um, but it isn't, it isn't that there are no students. And the biggest point, as John uh, mentioned, is, you know, is there going to be a cliff down the road? And not only will there be a cliff from the international students, but the issue is, then after that, there'll be a cliff with regards to research. So in my view, we do have time. So you could see it as a very negative thing, or you could actually say, we do have an opportunity to pivot and be prepared. And I think more importantly that I, I'm, as a medical researcher, I'm sitting on a lot of the health uh, COVID response committees, and we've been looking very carefully at the issue of quarantining, uh, particularly when it relates to travel, tourism and international students. And Dan Tien, the Minister for Education, has a very focused mind on the return of international students. I don't think anyone in Australia 
would blame the, 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 the universities for the model that they've developed. In fact, having sat um, for the last year on the Trade Investment Growth Parliamentary Committee, it is celebrated as a model. That's an excellent services trade export model. And in our committee report of trade transformation that we've just delivered, we celebrate the universities. Uh, model and how we could think about using it for things like health services, um, tourism and um, fintech services uh, to the region as well. So I probably would put it put out there as a sort of provocative concept that we don't necessarily need to see that Australia is going to be shutting its doors to international students. And in fact, we may have an opportunity to move more quickly um, to attract more university students because the world has gone through a pretty amazing pandemic. It's not that this is an Australian problem. This is a global problem. Students, university students are still going to want um, to, um, to go to international, um, international destinations. There is no evidence of a lack of appetite for that. Um, and in fact, I asked the question on our Trade Investment Growth Committee, what will happen when Chinese universities increase their capabilities um, to educate their own students. There's a lot of evidence that that's now occurring. And DFAT's response was there is huge amounts of appetite across Southeast Asia. Um, other countries um, are already looking to Australia as educational leaders. So uh, as China uh, upskills its own universities, it might end up training more of its own um, students. And uh, But there's still a lot of appetite um, across Southeast Asia and other countries following on. And they expect it to run for another 50 years, at least is how it's modelled. So I don't think the model is broken. What it is is that we've got a short-term COVID issue that we need to deal with that will have medium-term consequences. And I will say that I know Victoria has this really nasty outbreak that's happening here. I'm less negative about um, Australia going to have a long-term health problem. I think we will get control of the COVID outbreak here. It seems very gloomy. We're very sombre at the moment. It is frightening for many people. But John, your point was, that we won't have students before the end of the year, that is correct. I don't think anyone would predict that. But I do think, and maybe I'm a deluded optimist, I'm a medical researcher after all, so that's got to be one of my critical criteria for being a successful medical researcher. But I think our international students will be able to return next year. And again, being inside government, I know that we've got a very focused mind on looking at quarantining issues to ensure that we can bring people safely here quickly. And there is a lot of research coming out suggesting that students don't just look at um, the rankings, the global rankings. They look at uh, the cultural receptivity of um, going to a new country. They look at the safety of that country. They look at um, how the universities welcome them, um, how they're viewed. And there's quite a lot of sort of soft diplomacy around attracting students. And I think it's important that Australia signals uh, as soon as we are open for business that we're not just open, we're welcoming and we're providing a lot of support, which is why it's very concerning uh, China's uh, sort of somewhat uh, aggressive stance that they've taken to some of the issues um, at a sort of a global diplomacy with regards to the COVID um, um, at pandemic, that we, 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 we play a very careful line about calling it out um, when they are not playing ball with regards to global health diplomacy and standing strong about the issues about accountability and transparency, but obviously not provoking them unnecessarily. But as I said, there are bigger and emerging markets outside of China, we should be looking to those markets and we should be feeling confident that Australia has managed the health epidemic here as well as any other country and until the last few weeks better than the vast majority of countries. And I don't think we're going to see the same, should I say, COVID carnage that has happened in other countries, which will play well because people say, well, you've obviously got a good health system and public health system. We should celebrate that and we should make people feel encouraged to come here to Australia as soon as we can. Thanks, Katie. Look, we'll get to audience questions in a moment. Uh, Andrew, one uh, last question for from me uh, for you. Um, what's the future for smaller regional universities? They face particular challenges at the moment, don't they? Well, this is actually going to be complicated by the reforms announced by Dan Tian last month, because what he's planning to do is reduce the funding rate for most uh, courses to something more like the national average cost of teaching and scholarship. But the difficulty is that regional universities typically have higher costs than metropolitan universities. You know, they have to run smaller campuses, they don't have economies of scale. On average, their students are more disadvantaged and need more assistance. And so that's going to create particular problems for them. There are some special funds, new funds aimed at regional universities, 
But overall, I think this is going to be more complicated for them than it is going to be for the metropolitan universities. And so how they will manage this, I think, is uh, a big issue in the next year or two. On the other hand, they have been less reliant on international students. And so, you know, they are falling from a less great height than some of the big metropolitan universities. Um, Katie, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so thank, thanks very much, Andrew. And I know you've um, done a lot of work into this area and have done some really important work into this area. I mean, I think as a government, we believe equity is incredibly important for um, students to access universities. We are a big believer in um, in delivering for regional and um, uh, rural uh, universities. And uh, we believe that equity is not just an issue of um, SES, but it's actually a, an issue of geography as well. Um, you know, just like um, health area, um, you know, we, we believe in, in investing in rural and regional um, health provision. We also believe education is incredibly important. And in fact, there has been, um, you know, some new visas um, opened up with regards to um, people going to regional and rural areas. Um, and if we are going to have this sort of concept of, uh, you know, decentralisation, should I say, of our population, because our, our inner cities are getting very congested and quality of life is sort of falling, um, people are now starting to think about the regional and rural areas. You need to have places where they can get jobs or have good health and education, and they need to have good transportation back to the hubs um, as necessary. So there is a, a real interest across not just the federal government, but state and um, I think territory governments about the regional and rural um, areas to invest in them, to, to help them to be vibrant. And universities, I believe, are a very important part of that because universities are where people start to put their roots down, they meet their, their partners in the future, and often they, they're more likely to stay there. Um, I, I would say that um, the, the sort of concept of... Um, you know, Zooming um, is going to be an interesting concept for universities and, and how they get on board with regards to digitalisation. Um, I think that there's some real opportunities there. I will say that um, federal government has invested, um, Andrew mentioned before, a $400 million investment into regional and rural um, universities. And they are less uh, research dependent, so their models um, will have different, um, different pressures going forward. But hopefully... Um, so it, when immigration restarts again, there will be some more opportunities to increase the, um, their sort of vibrancy going forward. But they do have uh, different sort of um, profitability and um, you know, business model issues uh, than the inner city university. So that's the one thing about the sector. It's not one size fits all. It's a very diversified sector. We need to be aware of that when we're making decisions. Thanks, Katie. John, uh, first question from the audience for you. How are you juggling finding the right balance between online and physical teaching with fewer staff? Um, well, the, it's a good question because um, we've obviously had to shift all of our teaching or most of our teaching online. Uh, there was a week in March where we paused our semester for seven days to give our staff a chance to move everything online which they did brilliantly absolutely brilliantly um and so that that's that's the current state of affairs um how we uh tackle this in the longer term as i said earlier um it, there will certainly be a bigger component of um mixed modes of delivery than was the case before we'd be moving in that direction anyway um uh, and we will need to ensure that we've got the, the enough staff to support um, the degrees that we want to offer. Um, I think the challenge is, um, because of the, the reduction in the size of uh, our revenue will mean a reduction in the number of people we're able to employ, um, we'll have to downsize the range of things we offer to make sure that the staff we are, are able to afford um, can support that more limited range of offerings. And that's why we're going through the process I mentioned earlier of identifying the areas in which we're really strong um, and where you know, our, uh, we, we potentially can attract students, not just internationally, but from all, all, over, from all over Australia. Um, and I think a lot of universities will be doing this. They'll be looking at you know, where, where do we think we can uh, attract students from more than just our local geographic footprint. Um, you know, we're, we're a university a bit, a bit unusual. We have a big, big metropolitan footprint in the north of Melbourne and a big regional footprint in north and central Victoria. So we're a hybrid 
uh, metro and regional. And I, I completely understand all of the challenges that, that Andrew, uh, Andrew is talking about for regional universities. Um, and I, th I think what we have to do is to adapt what we offer to the needs of the students, uh, as well as doing so in our areas of strength. And that, that's, as I said, a process that we were working on before all of this happened, but th this has really accelerated the urgency or increased the urgency with, the, the, with, which, we, with which we do it. Um, but uh, our philosophy is that we have to uh, reduce the work before we reduce the staff. Uh, and that means focusing on the things we're really good at. Thank you. Um, Andrew, perhaps one for you, having, having worked in uh, policy in, in this setting for a long time, um, the changes are going to need uh, to go beyond reviewing structures and staff and capital programs. What are some of the ideas that have been brainstormed previously that might now be reviewed? Uh, in terms of policy change? Yes. Well, well, the government's already, as we've sort of skirted around, got some pretty big policy changes on the way. And this is designed to encourage students to do uh, courses likely to lead to jobs by offering them big discounts on their student contributions, but uh, basically funded by big increases in student contributions in other courses, humanities, business, law. And so, I am not convinced at all that this will change student behavior. Uh, there's a lot of research showing that students are mainly driven by their interests and a few thousand dollars up or down on the student contribution won't change that. And what I think the government's lost an opportunity to do is actually incentivize universities to deliver uh, in these fields. As I mentioned before, uh, in many fields, universities are actually getting a slightly lower funding rate under the TN reforms than they would now including fields like some of the healths where we actually want more students. And so I think if we're going to design the system better, we really need to send the incentives mainly to the universities uh, to drive the courses, particularly in the health, engineering, uh, IT, where there is clear student demand and there is clear labour market demand. So I think the government has really picked uh, the wrong side of that supply and demand equation to, to drive the system. Thank you. Um, Katie, a question from uh, the audience for you. Could you um, explain the government's rationale in relation to not supporting the university sector, sector with JobKeeper? Um, look, I think the important thing to say is that the government has supported the university sector to the tune of $18 billion to keep um, the uh, university places open and uh, so it is already a supported sector so um, the response to the sector is different from um, you know the commercial sector so it's, it's a different construct and it is already being supported to a very large amount to be fair. Thank you. Look, the next question, John, um, is one for you. Uh, with most capital projects now um, having been cancelled by the university uh, sector, what will be the long-term impact uh, well, potentially significant on the construction industry. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we know that for every dollar spent by students um, on their university education, about another dollar fifty gets spent in the wider economy. Um, and I think the pausing of capital works is just one example of how that stimulus effect that universities have on their economic environment will be lost. Um, so the, yes, I mean, the, 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 the immediate impact will be um, fewer shiny new buildings on university campuses, I suppose, um, but that, that flows through to jobs. Um, and um, you know, the, 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 the impact of that will be long lasting, um, but it's just part of a, a wider picture of how that broader economic stimulus effect will be very muted um, for, the, for the foreseeable future. And I think we're already starting to see that, for example, in the housing sector, um, where the, the, the drop in international students is leading to a decrease in demand for rented property, for example. Um, so, you know, the, the, the wider economic impact, um, this will not just be felt by the university sector, um, it'll, be felt, it'll be felt much more widely. And if I could just respond to Katie's 
uh, point about job job keeper. Um, it's true that the, the the government does invest a lot in the higher education sector, but that eighteen billion dollars that Katie referred to was what was already in the budget. Um, now it's 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 good that the government is committing to maintain the university's share of public funding. That that's that's a good thing, but I don't want anyone to think that this is eighteen billion dollars that was suddenly magicked up over and above what was already coming in. That's that's the the the, the higher ed. Uh, uh, allocation um, that will continue. That's good, um, but I'm afraid it doesn't go anywhere near uh, addressing the, the the fact that you know we're going to be facing a big downturn in revenue, and in particular uh, that the three to four billion dollars a year that the university sector invests in research uh, just won't be there anymore, or it'll be significantly reduced. And I think, as I said before, that's that's where the the real pain will be felt. And a lot of those buildings that were being paused were to conduct that research. Um, they, they weren't, you know, shiny offices for staff. They were, you know, big research, for, but really important research facilities. Um, anyway, well, I've said enough. Well, actually that flows into a, a number of questions that are coming through um, and Katie Allen for, for you, just um, how do you see a, sustain, a sustainable funding um, stream for university research in the future? Look, I think it's important that people understand that the university is like a, a very, very large multi-billion dollar business and um, you know, universities get funding from different sources. So um, it isn't that, um, you know, the government isn't supporting the university sector and people, should, you know, the opposition have been very good at sort of saying, oh, the government's just dropped, you know, the bundle and it's not supporting the university sector. It just doesn't give, doesn't really reflect the reality. And so it's a very complicated uh, funding situation where it's based on government grants, uh, philanthropy, um, and international fees, and student fees as well. So there's a lot going on, and um, universities are very good at making it clear that they're going to have difficulties going forward. It may happen, it may not happen. We're aware of their concerns, um, but I have to say we're aware of concerns right across the economy. So uh, it's important that we take the opportunity to uh, make the business model responsive to the new post-COVID economy and to make sure that it's, it's delivering for the students that it needs to deliver for. So it's important to say that student fees, current student fees won't change. So those who are already committed to university won't have any change to the current student fees. And what is going to be rolled out is for future students so that we can help to incentivise students uh, to think about their jobs in the post-COVID economy. And we want them to think about it in a unit way, not in a, a sort of discipline way, because we want them to diversify their skill set so that they're ready for those jobs on the other side of COVID. Now, I know that's very controversial. Um, we do know that there was a change to uh, STEM funding by Kevin Rudd in 2008, 2009, and that had a pretty decent impact on, on the uptake of people um, dedicated to STEM subjects. So um, we can argue a lot around in circles about this, but the proof will be in the pudding. And it's important for people to know that this is about a philosophical approach to um, improving um, the graduates for their jobs in the future. Of course, change is always very hard. And I know the university sector, um, you know, has a particular funding model that is, uh, you know, at threat as are many um, you know, commercial entities, uh, funding entities right across Australia. So everybody understands this is not an easy situation. Uh, it's not through any fault of the universities. Uh, we need to work together um, and we need to try and fi find solutions. So the Minister for Education, Dan Teen, is meeting with the university sector, wants the university sector to come to the table um, and for us to provide the support that we need to, to, to provide. But it's not like governments have ever fully funded universities. They are independent statutory bodies that have their own uh, control of their own funds and that they charge fees, they have philanthropies, they're in charge of their destiny, we're there to support and partner with them. John, do you want to respond to that? Um, look, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I mean, universities do have multiple funding sources. Uh, and look, I completely accept that we're just one of many, many sectors who are really you know really facing difficulties uh, and that's why i said you know we're, we're grateful uh, that the government is planning to maintain our share of the available public funding that that's that's good um, but all i'm saying is that uh, there there will be implications for the national research and development effort 
Um, and I actually think that they're more imminent than Katie, Katie might have implied earlier on, that, you know, that we've got time to sort this out. I don't think we do. Um, and because as I said before, um, next year is the crunch year because we're gonna have not just the, the loss of revenue this year, but the compounded by loss of revenue next year. Um, if we are to, to avoid uh, serious deficits, um, we have to start taking action now. Uh, and that will mean removing cost, which is a, you know, a, a very harsh way of saying, we're gonna to have to take, take stuff out of our organizations. And that is gonna start having uh, an impact on, on the research effort. So I, I actually think it's the next few months, Katie, and I know you're right, uh, the minister is talking to some vice chancellors, um, but my understanding is that that's a timetable that will see proposals being brought forward for the budget next year. Um, I actually think it's a lot more urgent than that um, because universities will be making some very big decisions uh, between now and the end of the year and starting to implement them. Um, and uh, you know, it'll be on a scale that we've never ever seen before um, and I'm just very worried about the impact that this will have on the nation's uh, capacity to be innovative and to you know, improve productivity and all of those desirable things. Andrew, a question uh, for you from the audience. Free TAFE in Victoria certainly disputes the notion that students don't consider price. What can both sectors do to improve the TAFE, a TAFE to university pathway? you've got to think about the financial things holistically so it's a combination of both what will it cost me to study and then what are the financial benefits in jobs and salaries after i finish so it's a combination of those two things i think free tafe <coughs> excuse me has really attracted students at the lower end of the school lever atar range and for them i think there are real choices so when i was at Grattan institute we did some work on this and particularly for young men, we found that often they would in fact be better off financially in terms of getting a job and getting a job that uses their skills if they went down the TAFE pathway. And so just removing the obstacle to studying TAFE, I think is very, very important. I have to also in the vocational sector, unlike in higher education, there are still some upfront fees for many students. And so even though the total price might be much lower, the reality is you might still have to pay a few thousand dollars up front when you study in TAFE or in, in vocational education, and you don't have to do that in higher education. And so I think the free TAFE is just letting people often make the choice they should have made all along by removing that financial distortion around the fees. Katie Allen, how, how important is vocational education in the big picture thinking? Oh, look, I have to say this government has a very keen interest on vocational education. Um, I mean, I think the Prime Minister takes um, you know, quite a personal interest in it. Uh, his view is, you know, um, in, in fact, vocational education and universities are kind of sees as two great and important wings of our education going forward. Um, and, and, you know, also apprenticeships, there's a lot of interest in micro-credentialing. Uh, there's interest in sort of a nimble uh, market uh, to enable people of all different interests um, to get um, vocationally appropriate training. So I think it's a very important area. Look, I know there's, the, the sector's taken a lot of hits over the years as it's sort of been defunded. I think that's, most people agree with that. And I think there's a lot of interest in what can we do to, to, to ensure we move uh, these, these you know, tape, tape into the limelight, I suppose, because I think it's going to be more and more important, not less important. It is worth saying that we know that I think 90% of um, uh, jobs will require tertiary education and half of those will be university uh, the other half will be TAFE. So we're going to have to make sure that these sectors both um, are robust and resilient. So it's not, there's no question about the requirement um, for continued investment. There will need to be um, some, some pivoting um, and some, some alterations, but um, there, there, there's going to have to be business models that are sustainable into the future. And, you know, Joan, I completely take your point, which is that research is going to potentially suffer. But I um, feel hopeful about some of the the concepts of um, particularly things like partnering with industry going forward. We know that science and innovation are probably a little bit biased on this being a scientist myself, but we know that science and innovation is so incredibly important for economies to be nimble and, and prepared for the future. Um, we know science and innovation is at sort of the heart of many new jobs to be created. 
um, and um, it's also the way that um, a, 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 our culture thinks of itself where we're a resilient but more importantly we're a very resourceful um, country and um, there's some you know incredible benefits that have been taken out of um, being resourceful and innovative um, we've taken advantage of things like telemedicine um, to ensure that our regional and rural patients get access to tertiary care and quaternary care and we're you know some of the first users of that um, in in, our, in in this country because we needed to we needed we've got vast tracks and patients have, have difficulty traveling all over the place but now telemedicine which will be a legacy of COVID will be used for people in cities who can't get to where they need to get to because of congestion I uh, also don't want to have to take time off work and perhaps haven't been going to the doctors in an appropriate way. So there's lots of opportunities um, for us to, to build um, on an innovative agenda. I'm a big, big supporter of innovation, but you cannot do that without continued funding into research. There is a gaping hole, a valley of death that is going to open up as a chasm. So I'm with you on the problem. Um, and um, I can't talk about what the solution is because I'm not part of that conversation. I've got a few ideas myself. Um, but I am quietly pushing behind the scenes for those solutions to come forward very quickly. Um, and what I mean by um, the research agenda is that we know that um, you know, staff have got uh, their funding at the moment, but what happens, research agendas tend to have more of a lag than a lead. And so um, it, the outcomes won't be known for a number of years. What I'm saying is, you, yes, you'll see job loss, but you won't see the impact on our research fraternity for a number of years that's what I mean by yes we need to move quickly we need to move um, to cushion uh, the sector now because the impact will be uh, felt for years to come if we don't do something about it now Can I, can, can I, sorry, go on. Can I, can I just add on this question of free TAFE um, I, I think the um, the coexistence or the cohabitation of uh, vocational and higher education is still one of the biggest policy challenges in, in, in post-secondary education in this country. We haven't got it right. Um, I'm a big fan of free TAFE. I think it's potentially one of the most significant measures to boost post-secondary participation we've seen since the demand-driven system. Um, but I, it does worry me that students are making choices based on those financial incentives rather than on what's best for them. Um, and I, I think both universities and TAFE have probably been guilty of trying to promote themselves at the expense of the other. I really don't think that's helpful. Um, there, uh, my view is that there should be a close partnership between the two, that we should operate on the basis of parity of esteem. TAFE is really good at doing what TAFE does best, and universities are really good at doing what they does, do best. Um, one is not better than the other. But we need to work together to make sure that students make the right choices for themselves and that they can see pathways from one to the other uh, in either direction. I mean, uni students could benefit from TAFE qualifications, for heaven's sake, just as much as TAFE students would benefit from uh, taking what they've learned at TAFE and turning it into a bachelor's level or higher degree. So I, I, this is a nut we haven't cracked yet. Uh, I feel quite passionate about this because I've seen this, um, when it works well in the regions, it works fantastically well. We get a lot more kids into post-secondary school uh, education than we would otherwise, um, but so many of the ingredients have to be in place and there's nothing really to guarantee that they'll, they'll be there. But uh, uh, this is, a, as you can tell, a topic that's very close to my heart. Can I, can I add that, that there has been a little bit of work? I know sometimes people might say we want the big announcements and the big funding, but there's been a bit of work about, you know, unique student identifiers that can go across the different sectors. And at a pragmatic, purely pragmatic level, those sorts of things can be really helpful for us to be able to track students' journeys because until this point, we haven't been able to do that very effectively and therefore tailor educational journeys for students. And so I, you know, I concur with John that we need to make sure the student is at the heart of what we're wanting um, to um, help them achieve. Um, but we also, I think the students themselves are likely to go, well, you know, our interests are in eventually getting a job. Um, and that's why I think the taxpayer has every right for, you know, there are a lot of people who didn't go to university, they're paying taxes for us to have an educated workforce going forward that is going to be job ready. And if you want to pay for something that isn't necessary in that direction, you still have the freedom to do that. But I think there's a lot of pragmatic things that we can do to help the journey for the student to make sure that they have good outcomes for them and for the community. 
Well, thank you. That's, that's really all we have time for today. We could go on, but thank you to Dr. Katie Allen, Federal Member for Higgins, to Professor John Dewar from La Trobe University and Professor Andrew Norton from ANU. And thank you to our audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions. Now we have three more talks in this series and bookings are now open on the library's website. I look forward to seeing you next Friday and that session is at 12.30. In the meantime, and there's plenty for you to explore online and on social through library in your lounge. Stay safe and well.